Given America's well-known predilection for ice cream, it may surprise someone to learn that the United States doesn't lead the world in ice cream consumption. Despite consuming a bit more than five and a half gallons per person of the frozen concoction, the United States lags behind New Zealand in personal ice cream eating. Still, America is no slouch when it comes to the enjoyment of ice cream, which once had the reputation of being a luxury food available only to the world to do. Once refrigeration and industrialization made it readily available to all Americans, ice cream became part of folklore. In the great American tradition, tall tales and myths developed around ice cream, including the origin of many of the popular ways in which it is consumed. The origin of the ice cream cone became an urban legend with disputed versions created regionally. So did the backstory for the ice cream sundae, its cousin the banana split, the malted milkshake, and the nearly uncountable number of flavors offered to consumers. Number 10. It started as a food for the wealthy. Records of ice cream consumption in the colonies of North America date back to the mid-18th century, and recipes describing its preparation date from even earlier. Although there are records of indigenous peoples enjoying snow and ice shavings flavored by various means, the combination of cream, sugar, and flavorings blended to near-frozen consistency, ice cream arrived with the Europeans. For nearly a century, the dish remained known only to the well-to-do. It was expensive. Sugar was a luxury for most Americans of the day. Ice, though ubiquitous in Windsor was expensive in the warm months. Thomas Jefferson is sometimes wrongly credited with introducing ice cream to America, having encountered it in France. Jefferson was undoubtedly fond of ice cream, as were many of his fellow Virginians. During the early years of the new government under the Constitution, much of America's wealth centered in and around Philadelphia. Wealthy Americans favored ice cream as dessert at formal meals, and those few who could afford to emulate their betters ordered ice creams from confectioners in Philadelphia, Baltimore, and other large cities. Less well-off Americans, unable to afford sugar and ice in large large quantities found the concoction to be a rare treat. Ice creams began to appear in American cookbooks and recipe collections in the late 18th and early 19th century, as well as descriptions of the equipment needed to make it in quantity. Jefferson served ice creams in what was then known as the President's House, the White House, including a concoction in which frozen ice cream was served in a baked crust. So, although the third president helped popularize the dish, it remained primarily a treat for those who could afford it, rather than a food for the common man. Number 9. Philadelphia became the ice cream capital of the United States in the early 19th century. Philadelphia served as the capital of the young United States from 1790 to 1800, a time when it also represented the largest urban area of the new nation. Though the capital moved to Washington City in 1800, Philadelphia continued to thrive as a commercial and financial center. Small entrepreneurs who established businesses, tailors, dressmakers, bootmakers, cobblers, stationers, and most important for the discussion here, confectioners, made Philadelphia a booming area of commerce in the early 19th century. One such entrepreneur was Augustus Jackson, who had once served, according to some sources, as the White House's chef. Sources describing Jackson and his contribution to ice cream in America are questionable at best. One source describing Jackson also claims George Washington brought ice cream pot freezers to Mount Vernon, souvenirs of a trip to France. Unfortunately, Washington never visited France, though he did have a documented taste for ice cream. Augustus Jackson never applied for any patents involving the manufacture of ice cream. None of the many recipes attributed to him survive, and the locations of his ice cream manufactories are are disputed. Nevertheless, he is credited by some as being the father of ice cream. Whether Jackson contributed significantly or he was just an American myth, ice cream manufacturing and consumption grew rapidly in the antebellum era in Philadelphia. As America's largest city, it harbored a steadily growing confectioner's industry. As a major port, its wharves and warehouses teemed with exotic flavors, as well as the produce of inland farms and sugar from the Caribbean Isles. Without refrigeration for long periods, ice cream was made to order and consumed in parlors, coffee shops, tea rooms, and in private homes. By the 1840s, it was shipped, packed in ice and sawdust, to cities and towns on the inland waterways and the post roads. Number 8. The first American commercial ice cream factory opened in 1851. Commercial manufacture of ice cream, that is, not made to order by customers, began in 1851, when an enterprising Quaker milkman recognized an opportunity. In the tiny York County community of Seven Valleys, Pennsylvania, Jacob Fussell used excess milk and eggs to manufacture ice cream. That which he could not sell locally, he shipped on the newly opened railroad to Baltimore. By 1854, demand in Baltimore was sufficient that Fussell shifted his manufacturing of ice cream to the city. Fussell's 1854 ice cream factory in Baltimore is recognized as the birthplace of the commercial ice cream industry in the U.S. Ice cream was no longer just a treat for the rich. Fussell expanded his operations steadily over the ensuing decade despite the Civil War and its disruptions of railroad traffic. By the mid-1870s, he had ice cream manufacturing plants in operation in New York, Boston, and Washington City. His manufacturing in bulk allowed him to sell his products more cheaply than locally 
he produced ice cream and growth was steady. Still, ice cream sales and shipping are hampered by the need for ice during the manufacturing, shipping, and storage phases. Ice cream continued to have a relatively short shelf life, especially in the warm months of the year. Nonetheless, by the time of the nation's centennial in 1876, ice cream was a food for the masses rather than a speciality known only to the wealthy. Locally based dairies and confectioners merged to form regional ice cream manufacturing interests. Ice cream was sold in bakeries and shops, dairies and drug stores, as well as in general stores and from speciality vendors in large cities and small towns. In the aftermath of the Civil War, it surged in popularity, coupled with other mass-produced products designed for conspicuous consumption. Number 7. The ice cream soda was invented in 1874. Following the American Civil War, pharmacists and chemists found a new demand for carbonated beverages. Marketed as tonics to aid digestion and help alleviate vapors and other euphemisms for feminine complaints, they included such concoctions as Coca-Cola, root beer, and ginger ales, and just plain carbonated water. Since pharmacies were often the local source for ice cream, it was inevitable that sodas and ice cream would somehow meet in a glass. And in a typically American manner, scores of stories emerged over the years describing how the earth-shaking event transpired. All are exaggerations, though some may have a slight relationship with the truth. Among the most popular tales of the birth of the ice cream soda is the fortuitous discovery of the beverage during the 1874 Franklin Institute celebration in Philadelphia. In that version, Robert McKay Green, a vendor of carbonated beverages, supplemented his dwindling supply of ice to cool his drinks by substituting ice cream. Such events are a part of American ice cream lore, a combination of Yankee ingenuity, divine inspiration, and stunning success. They also are mostly fake. Green later admitted to experimenting with various soda ice cream combinations well in advance of the fair, which explains why he had price lists and flavor combinations available as needed. Many other tales describe the invention of the ice cream soda, and Green was conscious enough of the conflicting claims to insist that his gravestone include the inscription, Originator of the Ice Cream Soda. The beverage gave birth to two American icons, the soda fountain, which became a fixture in towns across America, and the soda jerk, a piece of Americana which lasted well into the 1950s. Number 6. Blue Laws Led to the Name Sunday for Ice Cream with Toppings in the late 19th century, several drives gained momentum across the United States, united only by their determination to ensure that Americans weren't having fun. Fundamentalists were aghast at the rampant sin flagrantly displayed everywhere in Nickelodeons and movie houses, on vaudeville stages, and of course in saloons and houses of ill repute. Patent medicines available everywhere and cheaply were often viewed as dangerous and sinful intoxicants. Among the latter were medicinal beverages sold as syrups blended in drugstores and soda fountains, many such as Coke. Coca-Cola, 7-Up, Dr. Pepper, and others were marketed as digestive aids, stimulants, and cures for feminine disorders. As such, they qualified as intoxicants, at least the intrepid guardians of public moors who lobbied for their sales to be banned on Sundays. Included among these threats to American morality was simple carbonated water when blended with various flavors or syrups into a beverage. In communities across the nation, the need to protect the Sabbath led to the banning of sodas on Sunday, which led to decreased sales of ice cream. To protect their profits, ice cream vendors offered a dish containing all ingredients of popular sodas, ice cream, a syrup topping, sprinkles, nuts, whipped cream, etc. In short, everything except the offending soda. They called this their Sabbath ice cream Sundays, later evolved to Sunday. Or at any rate, so the story goes. To Rivers, Wisconsin has long claimed to have been the birth site of the ice cream sundae, a claim supported by none other than H.R. Mencken in the early 20th century. Mencken's history as a hoaxer of renown has done little to dissuade Two Rivers' claims over the years. Other towns, notably Ithaca, New York, dispute the Wisconsinites as mere posers. Evanston, Illinois, claims to have invented the name of the ice cream sundae, Garwood's Drugstore, with the endorsements of the Everston branch of the Women's Christians Temperance Union. How they balance the sundae against the sin of glass Gluttony is unrecorded. Number 5. Milkshakes and malts evolved from the ice cream soda. The earliest known versions of the milkshake were simply milk floats, which featured ice cream floating in a glass of milk flavored with syrup. A malted milk was a separate beverage entirely, flavored milk fortified with malted milk powder, the latter believed to be a digestive aid, read laxative. In 1922, a soda jerk working for Chicago's Walgreens drugstore added ice cream to their malted milk beverage, blended the whole, and created the first malted milkshake. The combination proved so popular, the term malt shop gradually supplanted ice cream parlor as the destination of choice in pursuit of ice cream pleasure. Milk slash ice cream beverages, Sands Malt, became known under several names regionally, including Frappes, New England, Egg Creams, the South, Milkshakes or Shakes in the Midwest, and Frosted, as well as other names, though nearly all were procured by visiting a malt shop. Special 
special blend has rapidly evolved to prepare them in the presence of the customer. Milkshakes and malts never endured the sniffing disdain once reserved for sodas, which is interesting because the original milkshake was a beverage which included whiskey, milk, and egg. In the 1960s, the American fast food industry made shakes ubiquitous, and so they remain today an altogether American innovation. Number four, the banana split is claimed as an invention by at least two communities. A dishful of conspicuous success, the banana split is a sundae with at least one banana, multiple scoops of ice cream, several different toppings, whipped cream, additional toppings such as nuts, sprinkles, crumbled cookies, and of course, maraschino cherries. Such a gastronomic extravaganza, all nearly nutrition-free calories, could only be an American innovation. And such it is. Yet it should be no surprise that American communities dispute which should be acknowledged as the creator of the dish. Latrobe, Pennsylvania, home of Arnold Palmer, Rolling Rock Beer, and the St. Lee PBS television star Mr. Rogers is one of them. Latrobe claims a local pharmacy clerk by the name of Doc Strickler invented the banana split in 1904 while working at Tassel's Pharmacy. Supporters of the claim cite ample proof, including the existence of receipts for dishes designed to accommodate the unusual dimensions of the Sunday, though actual sightings of the the receipts are unrecorded. Latrobe's defense of its claims is chiefly aimed at Wilmington, Ohio, a small college town which claims to have been the first to split the banana in 1907. Their version of the tale has local entrepreneur Ernest R. Hazard inventing the banana split, some say as part of a competition to attract more students from Wilmington College to enjoy his wares. Both communities sponsor annual festivals dedicated to the banana split and to denigrating the claims of the usurper, whichever that may be. There are other pretenders to the throne as well. Chicago, Walgreens, Boston, Butler Department Store, Columbus, Ohio, Davenport, Iowa, and even New Orleans claim to be the birthplace of the banana split. But the main dispute seems to be between La Trobe and Wilmington. At least they agree that to be a banana split, the fruit must be split lengthways with scoops of ice cream nestled between the halves. If the banana is sliced crossways, the result is no banana split, but rather a mere banana royale. Number three, the ice cream cone became popular in the early 20th century. Probably the most famous of the legends surrounding the advent of the ice cream cone is that of the comestible being created during the St. Louis Exposition in 1904. Allegedly, an ice cream vendor short of glassware gained the cooperation of a waffle vendor short of customers, and the ice cream cone was born, another example of Yankee ingenuity, resolving a crisis to the benefit of all. A similar story exists regarding the creation of the hot dog bun. Both are untrue, but both seem to be too good in the retelling to let die. In reality, edible containers for ice cream were on hand as planned for the St. Louis Exposition, and although not particularly well known, they were nothing new. Recipes for edible containers for ice cream existed in French cookbooks in the mid-19th century, where they were called cornets. Ice cream eaten on baked trays similar to cookies was known to Jefferson during his presidency. In fact, a patent for an ice cream cone was issued to one Italo Maraccioni in 1903 in New York City. Another predecessor to the ice cream cone was the Hokey Pokey, another Italian innovation in which cornstarch and sugar were blended with water and then frozen. The result was an edible dish perfect for the consumption of ice cream, which appeared in the mid-1880s. So, edible conveyances for ice cream were well known prior to the St. Louis Exposition in 1904 and commonplace throughout. The exposition, in addition to being a world's fair, was a display of new industrial and commercial products, and the popularity of edible ice cream dishes called generically cornucopias was duly noted. The popularity of the ice cream cone skyrocketed following the fair and ever since, but it was likely not an accidental invention born of necessity as legend attests. Number two, soft serve ice cream was invented in the United States. There are ice cream aficionados who look with disdain at soft serve ice cream. To the purists or snobs, soft serve ice cream is little more than frozen yogurt or ice milk or some other lesser concoction unworthy of the name ice cream. Soft serve ice cream is a mixture which contains less milk fat than its hardier relative and which attains its creamier consistency due to the injection of air during the freezing process. Since it's ice cream, there should be no surprise that its invention is a point of dispute and contention. Both Carvel and the group which became Dairy Queen both claim credit, and their there are others who contend for the title as well. Tom Carville claims that a flat tire suffered during Memorial Day weekend 1934 forced him to sell his steadily melting ice cream from the back of his truck. He noticed throughout the weekend the crowd seemed to enjoy the softened ice cream which inspired him to develop and market the product. The story remains Carvel's official line, despite there having been no Memorial Day weekend in 1934. The holiday was on a Wednesday. In 1939, Carvel developed the first soft-serve ice cream machine according to their corporate history. Dairy Queen claims their process first appeared in 1938, selling their soft-serve mixture in Kanakee, Illinois. Soft serve ice cream is another wholly American invention and is even referred to as American ice cream in some foreign lands. As with evidently all things involving ice cream, it has its shares of legends and myths 
fans and detractors. Number 1. America is the second largest consumer of ice cream in the world per capita. America was once a land where ice cream was an extravagance enjoyed only by the wealthy. The huddled masses simply couldn't afford it. Times changed. Today, Americans consume an average of 20 liters per person per year of ice cream in all of its many forms. Yet even that rate of consumption is insufficient to rank Americans as the worldwide leader in ice cream eating. That distinction belongs to New Zealand, which consumes over 28 liters per person per annum. The most popular flavor is vanilla. Americans prefer chocolate, and according to the International Dairy Foods Association, almost three quarters of Americans Americans, 73%, consume ice cream at least once per week. Even a person as far-seeing as Thomas Jefferson could not possibly have predicted how ice cream evolved in the United States. Although he ate ice cream off of cookies and enjoyed a summer dish similar to baked Alaska, could he have predicted ice cream sandwiches? One suspects not. In a growingly health-conscious America, ice cream sales have dropped slightly over the past decades, though the sale of premium ice creams continues to grow. Perhaps the health-conscious have heard of studies which show that consuming ice cream following a workout promotes muscle growth if consumed within two hours of exercise. It also helps impede the breakdown of proteins. Chocolate milk has been accorded some of the same attributes, meaning the creation of a sports drink somewhat different from the norm could actually be good for health.